thinking about the listeners that are, you know, maybe in graduate school and looking for what their future directions are, is academia still good for you? Realizing that whatever workplace you decide to go into, that abuse is not okay. Like yeah. you can ask for what you need. You can, you know, speak up for yourself, especially after graduate school where you actually do have more power than you think. Hey folks, thank you for tuning in to the Grad School Sucks podcast, the show for grad students who want to survive grad school and thrive in their career afterwards. I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and today I'm talking with Dr. Liz Slonena, also known as Dr. Liz Listens. Liz Slonena is a clinical psychologist in private practice who specializes in working with trauma and ADHD. Liz joins the podcast to talk about how she got diagnosed with ADHD while in grad school, why burnout and exploitation are endemic in grad school, as well as what we can do about it, and how awesome life after grad school can be despite what you may experience as a grad student. This is a great episode for anyone who feels like they are struggling to survive the pressures of grad school and needs a pick-me-up to get them through the semester. Quick note, this episode does contain discussions of various kinds of exploitation of graduate students. So if you are not in a headspace where you want to listen to that right now, consider skipping this episode. Be sure to rate and review the podcast if you like today's episode. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. Well, Liz, thank you for coming on the podcast. It is so fun to talk to you today. Uh, If you could... Uh, just to start off, give our listeners just a little introduction into who you are. Yeah, well, I'm so happy to be here. I am Dr. Liz Slonena. I am a licensed psychologist in Asheville, North Carolina, and I do a lot of different interesting things. Um, I have my own private practice where I really focus on working with creative professionals and entrepreneurs, reclaim their power, banish burnout, and heal attachment trauma um, by essentially giving the middle finger to perfectionism, imposter syndrome, people pleasing, and self-doubt. Uh, I also collaborate with a lot of uh, mental health and wellness apps for meditation and hypnosis, doing a lot of cool things there. And as a psychologist with ADHD, uh, really finding and helping mentorship with ADHD coaching because business can be really hard with an ADHD brain. Yeah, that is awesome. You you do a lot of things, and I I knew you... Uh, before we did this podcast, just digitally, as Dr. Liz Listens. Yes. That's right, on Instagram. That's is right. that like Is that like the main place that you're active in terms of social media? Instagram is definitely the biggest one. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also on YouTube where a lot of my meditations are and hypnosis tracks. Um, Facebook, even though Facebook is for old people now. <laughs> um LinkedIn, but eh, that's kind of a weird space. Yeah, um, yeah. I've tried to get into TikTok, but TikTok is, I don't know, it, it's not very intuitive for me. So long yeah. story short, mostly Instagram. For sure. For sure. Okay. So if you're listening, it's Dr. or Dr. Liz, L-I-Z, listens on Instagram. I'll also put it in the um, episode description for this episode in order so people can just click on and go to it. And you also have a podcast, right? I am in the process of doing that. Um, So it'll be a mixture of um, ADHD, business support, um, how to thrive with ADHD, and some interesting things on learning how to use mindful hypnosis and mindful self-hypnosis to get shit done. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. All right. Well, I feel we have so much to talk about. So yeah, I'm excited. From the beginning, uh, let's just start with what made you go to grad school? Backing up even further, um, I always had dreams of being an artist. Mm. And with that, trying to find careers of like, okay, how can I create art? And I also really like science. How could I merge both together? And I had the grand idea like, oh, can I double major in psychology and art? Nope, 
not allowed to because both are really intense. Um, wanted to do biomedical illustration, which is essentially the illustrations that you see in textbooks. But unfortunately, the University of Florida um, closed down that major, which really sucks. Mm -hmm. So psychology. I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm really enjoying just the human mind. I'm finding creativity and just how the mind works. Um, and then, well, we can't really get any kind of job with a bachelor's of science in psychology. So of course it's okay, go into grad school, get a real job. Um, so with graduate school, with kind of my all or nothing kind of way of like, well, hey, let me be a doctor. Um, let me see, you know, what this can be like. Uh, and that's what really allowed me to be where I am now. And of course, all the struggle of actually going to graduate school and surviving graduate school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, what do you think kind of influenced you to specifically pick psychology? It's going to sound really nerdy, but, um, really being influenced by a lot of movies and TV shows, specifically Fringe. Um, ah. Yeah, and just be like, oh, this is so cool, the human mind, like Fringe science. Can I do something like that? And the interesting research on, you know, psychedelics, essentially, that's like the main plot sure. thing in Fringe. And then um, Internal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That mm. was yeah. very impactful for me. And um, yeah, yeah those psychological thrillers. I'm like, Ooh, can I, can I get a career in doing this? Um, oddly enough, I never like watched Goodwill hunting or like the stereotypical mm -hmm. what's, what does a psychologist or therapist do, which probably is for the best because they're God fucking awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so what was your experience like as a grad student? The worst five years of my life. Yeah. 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 What was, uh, what was so tough about it? Uh, my goodness. Where to begin? Um, well, at first I would say the first year it was just like so much excitement of, Oh yay. I'm finally getting accepted to do what I've always wanted to do and dreamed of doing with the harsh, you know, competition of getting into a PsyD program. Mm. Um, and then it started to really set in of like, Oh, prestige comes with a price. Mm. Um, and the program that I went to, and just for listeners, I'm purposely being very um, professional and not mentioning names or stuff because, hey, uh, don't want to burn any bridges. Um, but this, this program was very intense, um, technically a five-year program going through, there was no breaks whatsoever. There was classes, research, and clinical work for four years straight. And then fifth year is um, a full-on internship where you have to apply basically to graduate school all over again and hope you match. Um, mm. So it was just extremely intense of just the amount of shit you have to do in a day, um, as well as the very blatant exploitation that happens in graduate school, especially being a woman. And I didn't know this at the time, but being undiagnosed with ADHD, um, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. And for a lot of, you know, prestigious programs or just graduate programs in general, the ethos is grad school sucks. You got to suck it up to survive and exportation is a norm in order to get through and just get that degree. Yeah. Yeah. So for probably the majority of listeners, uh, they're current grad students and they see examples of exploitation, you know, probably on a pretty regular basis, depending on where they are uh, for a minority, maybe like 20% of the listeners, they're actually undergrads who are thinking about going to grad school. So uh, if you wouldn't mind breaking down, what, what, when you say exploitation in grad school, what specifically do you mean? Oh, man, where to begin? Um, first thing that comes to my mind is essentially slave labor. You yeah. are working incredibly long, hard hours without any breaks for nothing. Sometimes it's very lucky to get paid for the lab research that you do or your finances depend on some other person's grant. Mm -hmm. um, so 
like the cost of living, the quality of living is um, significantly reduced, maybe compared to your other peers that are, you know, out of college, making bank, and you are making less than maybe what you did in college. Um, as far as the other points of exploitation of just time and energy just being taken away from you, are the, how to put it, oftentimes mentors and labs, they can use your work without citing you at all. Not even putting you into the comment section or giving you a citation or even authorship. And that is very, very real. Or you do all the work and you are not first author. They are. Yeah. Um, so that is very, very common, um, especially with women in academia. Mm. And it is really unfortunate that you, you really can't get a lot of help because that is the norm. Um, and it, it really is unfortunate. And for a lot of folks, that is what either turns them away or they say, nope, I'm out. Or they have no interest in going to academia further. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I feel like this is the first time on the podcast we that I've had a real explicit conversation about exploitation in grad school. And obviously I joke a lot about I joke a lot about it in memes on the Instagram account, but yeah, I mean it's it's very real. And you know, as a white dude, I'm afforded a fair amount of privilege in like ways that I can avoid certain kinds of exploitation. Um that doesn't mean I I didn't experience it and definitely doesn't mean I didn't see it uh with some of my friends. I mean I think a lot of, I think there are a lot of things, at least that I saw, um, I, I saw it a lot with international students. Oh, yeah. Who were dependent on, you know, the visa status being linked with their being a grad student, which was linked with their being having their assistantship and doing their hours. And um, yeah, when you give that much power to individuals and you don't put a lot of oversight into it, then uh, yeah. You're, you you get a lot of exploitation. Oh, yeah. Um, and I feel like it's a thing that, at least for me, I didn't, I didn't hear about, I didn't see about, or I didn't see it until I was like a year or two in. And by that point, you're kind of like in the cult and, you know, you're, you're getting indoctrinated and things are getting normalized that maybe on the outside wouldn't be normal. But totally. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate you bringing that topic up and, and sharing a bit about it because yeah. it's... I feel like it's something that it's easy to laugh about and, and normalize afterwards because you just want to put it in that box and not think about it anymore. Um, but that's also like, oh, there's a therapy term. <laughs> I'm trying to follow your mind there. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's about when like you give to the next generation what you got. Mm. Uh, typically the bad things. I don't know. Oh, um, okay. Oh, I'm thinking of just like it, abuse cycles. Um, yeah, but yeah, trauma yeah, bonding, yeah. but yeah, just the abuse continues because it does. I, I see this, I mean, obviously in academia, but also in, um, the private practice realm or oh, really? supervision. Yeah. Yeah. Being like, Oh, I was, you know, sometimes mentors and supervisors can be, uh, emotionally and verbally abusive mm -hmm. and that just continuing on, um, intergenerational trauma. Yeah of, oh, I had it a lot worse. You're getting mm -hmm. it easy. Um, and that's still not okay because right. a lot of people leave the field or just abandon it completely and hate it because of essentially your mentor, you, your supervisor is kind of like your your family member, your, your parent mm -hmm. when it comes to the field. And as we probably already know, family dynamics make a huge difference. And how you thrive and trauma too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, <coughs> yeah, I don't remember where I was going with that. I, I'm sure we could talk, we could talk a lot about exploitation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And people have, have shared stories with me about forms of exploitation that I didn't even believe would happen uh, in grad school, and it's amazing 
what happens, especially like, you know, in the higher pressure places where there's, you know, higher expectation, there's more like reward for winning or, you know, getting that recommendation letter, getting on that grant, that kind of a thing. Totally. The pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Really put the pressure on. The pressure makes people do insane things, um, mm -hmm. even cut down their colleagues or um, in a way of sabotaging other people's like research experiences and experiments. Um, but honestly, like the exploitation can be truly endless. Not only is it kind of like idea stealing or not, um, you know, correctly citing uh, publications or authorship, but also exploitation of power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, yeah, your survival completely depends on how well you are doing in the eyes of your mentor and in your program. They can at any time like a very, I don't know, uh, abusive or dictatorship, just kick you out of the program or not give you any funding, even yeah. though you are working your ass off. And those power dynamics, not only work included, can severely impact your mental health, your well-being, how you see yourself, as well as it is not um, atypical that actual verbal, physical, and sexual abuse happens yeah. between mentorships and mentees. Yeah, and and that's that's some of the abuse that I didn't hear about firsthand when I was a grad student, but with the account, I've heard stories of you know grad students getting heavy objects thrown at them yeah. in meetings that they was intended to hit them in the head. Um, I've heard of like sexual advances that were definitely unwanted. And literally the, you know, object that they dangled in front of the person was like, I will get you this next postdoc that you want. I will put you second place on this next grant. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then I'm going to destroy your career. And exactly. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's insane what, what goes on sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, were you going to oh, say something? Yeah, and it's just amazing that this happens and there's so much silence mm -hmm. and stigma because yeah you are passionate you're in this career or thinking about getting in this career because you have so much passion that this sacrifice of what between two to five years is worth it or you're like in it for the thick of it and you need to get right. that fucking degree that yeah sometimes you would do anything just to get through yeah. these deep dark times um, and with someone very powerful who is your boss, your future, your letters of recommendation, they truly hold so much power over you, even in graduate school and even beyond. Mm -hmm. So it is it is a very delicate dance and it is so unfortunate that these this shit happens all the time. Yeah. And Title IX and the graduate programs, they really don't do anything about it um, due to the feared stigma and the lack of, you know, grants that they'll get um, mm -hmm. and just wrapping it all up in capitalism. Yeah, there was, I don't want to go too into it because I don't want to share the story for somebody else, but sure. um, someone shared a story with me that they did go to Title IX over uh, sexual abuse, unwanted sexual advances. It had been happening for a long time. She had a, several people who went with her, and they did take a report, but nothing was done because this guy had a lot of grant money, mm -hmm. and the university just wasn't going to punish him because he was bringing in, you know, $50 million a year or something. Yeah, yeah, and it's so unfortunate that the money is seen in the prestige of, or meaning to maintain that prestige is above and beyond someone's well-being, Yeah, and that's just fucked up. Um, and I will share um, my experience. It was not direct, but probably the worst thing that happened in my graduate program is that uh, a student died due to mental health reasons, mm -hmm. um, specifically around an eating disorder uh, during her time in the program. And uh, the mentor that I was receiving mentorship with uh, was 
partly responsible for that. Um, and it was really unfortunate that it was not the, the aftercare, the discussion of this and the mental health and just the ridiculous stress and expectations placed on the students was completely disregarded. Um, and there was no really ramifications for that, that mentor besides uh, that person stepping down and more of an elite position. But they are still there. They're still thriving. Mm -hmm. They're still getting, they're bringing in all the big money, even NIH grants. Um, so it is really concerning and, you know, very powerless in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. And for any listeners out there who maybe didn't experience this in grad school or maybe haven't been to grad school and they feel like they, they can't understand why something like this could go on, you know, I would hearken to kind of like a, a I don't know if it's a metaphor, it's a comparison to like being in a cult. You know, there are things that happen in religious sects and cults that most people in the mainstream look at and they say like, oh, well, I would never, you know, how could they let that happen? Why would they get into that? Why would they believe that? And it's that kind of a, a dynamic when you put it in the, in a dark closed in space that doesn't get light from the outside, um, all kinds of things can grow in that kind of a space. And when that's your main social circle, you can be convinced to believe that anything is normal to some degree, or that many things are normal, that maybe are not normal, or are not okay. And um, yeah, I, I, I have gotten the impression from a lot of folks who've graduated that I've talked with that there is this profound shift that you go through after grad school, and you're like, wow, did I really put up with all that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you know, there's like a systemic, there are systemic reasons why we put up with it, why future grad students may put up with it. And, um, yeah. yeah. That's a great metaphor. And adding to that as well, that fear is incredibly powerful and you will mm. do things, things that you never thought you would need to do or have to do in order to survive um, and kind of suppress that fear or just ride through it. Um, and very much similar to like cult dynamics, yeah, there is some extreme control, power, shame, humiliation, that, that old adage of, yeah, they'll break you down to build you back up again. And mm -hmm. that kind of ethos, and it, it is kind of just taking a step back and realizing most people... Um, no going in. Yeah, graduate school is going to be really hard. Like I'm pausing my life for how many long years it is for your program um, to dedicate myself to something I'm passionate about. And the no going in is going to be hard, but it is kind of interesting kind of surviving it and looking back and be like, holy fuck, that was so messed up. I don't know if I could do that again. Thank goodness I'm out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the listeners that are, you know, maybe in graduate school and looking for what their future directions are, is academia still good for you? Realizing that whatever workplace you decide to go into, that abuse is not okay. Like yeah. you can ask for what you need. You can, you know, speak up for yourself, especially after graduate school where you actually do have more power than you think. But I see this dynamic, and I'm speaking from my own experiences, of falling into even more exploitative uh, working conditions mm. because I'm like, shit, I just need a fucking job. I need to pay yeah. the bills. I need to you know, pay off loans if I have them. I'll take anything because spots, especially in academia, are so slim. Um, and it's kind of taking a step back and realizing, oh, is this worth it? Do I feel like I'm, you know, supported here? Uh, are my needs getting met? Um, and sometimes that is a really hard look in the mirror. Be like, ooh, this place is not good for me now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Liz, I want to get back to your story. Um, and maybe as a way of transition, what were some of the things... So you were in grad school. You yes. experienced some exploitation. Yes. What were some ways that you found... Um, that were effective in, in maybe minimizing like your exposure to exploitation or your ability to be exploited as a grad student? 
um, or ways that you coped or things that you'd recommend for people that may be in a similar situation right now? That's a great question. The thing that comes to mind as far as how to survive the exploitation, because frankly, it can be very hard to speak up and get change to happen, um, is leaning on your support system, whether it is your colleagues, letting them know. Um, I know I had a lot of fear and shame as um, I was literally on the brink of being kicked out of my graduate program through a constellation of fuckery. Um, that I was so terrified. I didn't want anyone in my program to know, but um, I found so much solace and, and peace of mind and support from my colleagues um, that really got me through it. Um, having, you know, calling up and having cry fest and just, you know, using our own psychology skills on each other, mm -hmm. you know, um, that support can really get you through the hardest shit because I don't think I could survive graduate school alone especially like yeah. studying for comprehensive exams, you know, really lean on your supports. You, you really don't have to do it alone. Um, another thing that was really helpful for me of just surviving the fuckery was getting my own therapist. Mm. Um, that was so helpful of having someone outside of the program um, to validate and kind of normalize him and say like, hey, that is not okay. Yeah. That that is abuse, um, and just having a kind of sounding board so you don't go insane or you kind of start to realize the gaslighting that happens. Um, and of course, you know, therapy is always great of learning how to learn new ways of coping and reframing your mind. Um, other things that were really helpful for myself as well, and part of my dissertation is using mindful hypnosis and mindful self-hypnosis for stress reduction, um, mindfulness skills, as well as resiliency and kind of really kind of protecting myself in a way of realizing, okay, my mentor or whoever is supervising me can say the meanest, cruelest things to me, but hey, I I'm more than those words. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still very challenging and reaching out to how many people you feel comfortable with so you don't have to suffer in silence and suffer alone. Yeah. Suffering in silence, that's the worst place to be. Mm -hmm. And hey, that's why memes are so fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So could you tell us a little bit about the, the end part of your graduate program? I know you did a PsyD. Is, is, there, is there a project at the end, like a dissertation? Yes. So uh, my program was essentially uh, a PhD program on steroids with clinical mm -hmm. work. So mm -hmm. we were researching and having um, a full-on dissertation as well as uh, clinical work year-round. Again, no breaks. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as um, rounding that out, what was your question specifically? Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, what was your, I guess, like capstone project or dissertation or the end of, of grad school like for you? Yeah. So with this, um, I'm trying to think back. Um, so dissertation is the big one, the big D, um, mm. preparing, you know, years in advance for it. Uh, so with that, you have to propose your dissertation um, and hopefully get it accepted and then do your dissertation. Uh, so my dissertation was kind of extra. Um, if I could, I probably could ask for an NIH grant, but it was um, examining the effects of mindful hypnosis, which inter uh, intersects both hypnosis and mindfulness for stress reduction. And specifically for this, I wanted to compare this audio-based intervention of three 20-minute sessions of mindful hypnosis compared to an active control condition, hmm. in addition to having them use the audio for seven days, do pre and post measurements of stress, mindfulness skills, and um, positive and negative statements about self. But um, I had a little bit of deception going on too, which is always mm. fun uh, and fun trying to get IRB to approve it. But really wanting to examine the 
in vivo stress results and effects. Um, so like perceived stress, but also in vivo um, validated stress by having participants um, do the Trier social stress test, um, the mm. TSST, which is a, a great validated systematic way of inducing both physiological, social, and emotional stress, where essentially you surprise the participant uh, by saying, hey, I want you to create um, a five-minute speech of why mm. you are the best person for your dream job. Mm. You have one minute to prepare yourself. Go. And then they do their little prepping, and then they come back, and then are um, they give their speech in front of two very stern confederates <laughs> that are kind of just like making notes and asking them really hard questions. And then after that, it's not done. They have to do really difficult mental math, um, specifically counting backwards from 17s from like 2058 um, mm -hmm. for the next five minutes. So as you can imagine, very stressful. Um, but it was a lot of fun to do it. Um, and I actually had significant uh, results, which are always wonderful and rare in the field of dissertation. Um, so with that, long story short, uh, mindful hypnosis compared to the active control condition significantly reduced immediate stress, like pre and post after listening to a mindfulness track, as well as significantly reduced the um, perceived stress and the in vivo stress during that uh, tree or social stress test. And probably the coolest thing is, is that the Mindful Hypnosis Group, they significantly increase their mindfulness skills in just seven days by using these tracks. So mm -hmm. it's very powerful, really easy to do, and it's great to see that there are really awesome results. And when I was kind of thinking about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know this was really helpful for me. How can I disseminate this to the world, to graduate students for something that is free and easy and so powerful and resilient making. Yeah. So what was it like to, to get those results in? <sighs> Exhilarating and, yeah. um, of course, stressful too. Um, but it's kind of like that sigh of relief of like, please, please, please. I just need like, you know, something to a pee of less than 0.05, yeah. please. Um, yeah. and yeah, it was like, uh, you know, medium effect size too, which was like, mm. holy shit. Hell yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and being like, okay, yay, I get, I can actually publish my results. Yay. Yeah. Cause a lot of dissertations, they just like fade into the background. Um, so it was really cool to be able to publish those results and a peer review, um, journal article, the journal of clinical and, um, experimental hypnosis, um, and continuing to build that, um, you know, research base moving forward. That is awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So what happened next after you're done with your dissertation? So after dissertation, it's like, yay, now what? Um, so with dissertation in my program, um, so fifth year, you uh, go off to internship, most likely off site. So states away, um, you were supposed to like come back to the university to defend in person. But I'm one of those people that I graduated during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I was one of the first people to do a zoom dissertation. And oh, yeah. it's just silly how people were freaking out, like, how can we do like a defense over zoom? What could happen? It's so stupid. It's fine. And I hope they continue that way. Because paying you know, $600 for a 20 minute presentation is just fucked up. Right. Um, anyway, so graduating, yay, big whoop. Didn't have a graduation party at all because the pandemic was just thick. Zoom ceremonies, which are really weird and why bother? Um, but then it was the aspect of, like, okay, finishing up internship, you know, checking that box, and then the mad dash of figuring out, well, what the fuck am I going to do with my degree now? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do for a job? Um, especially during the pandemic, um, in, like the height of 2020, um, it was kind of scary to think about, okay, what places are even hiring? Because the looming kind of things of like costs and how do you do therapy, like telehealth, how, how sustainable is that? Um, I decided not to go get a postdoc because I was, I was so fed up and done with academia. I'm like, I don't, yeah. I don't want to, you know, prove myself to anyone anymore. I got my degree. 
I'm fine. I'm going to continue learning the way that I learn best. Um, so it's like, okay, job security, that's not it. Uh, but I was very thankful that I just reached out um, to the Asheville community um, in North Carolina, just trying to see if there was any places to work in a group private practice. So thankfully, I landed a position in a group private practice, um, which for technically unlicensed, um, I guess, postdoc seeking psychologist is really rare because um, you can't get on insurance companies if you are not fully licensed. Mm -hmm. And technically and kind of business standpoints, that business is taking a loss to hire you on. Right. Um, so I was very thankful that that really worked out. Um, there was supervision in house so I can get that postdoc check mark to fulfill licensure. Um, but kind of those things of like, but is all, you know, rosy and gold. You start to see over time, oh, that's why clinicians are not staying here in this group practice. Mm. Um, and the continuation of capitalism, exploitation, um, HIPAA violations, and very, very, very mm. sketchy insurance um, stuff <laughs> happening yeah. that was uh, had like serious legal ramifications. I realized, oh, yeah, no, I'm not staying here long. <laughs> um, so with that, I've always had dreams of starting my own private practice up. And it was interesting how I was kind of forced in that position of like, oh, I need to do this now. Like I, I don't need to wait to build up skills and be, you know, in, you know, the field for 10 years before shedding, setting up my own shingle. I can do this now. Um, and I'm very thankful that one blessing of the, the, pandemic was telehealth is readily available. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for a lot of psychologists and other therapists out there, there was a kind of mass exit of agency work because how easy it was to set up your own practice. You don't need to have um, a bunch of overhead of buying an office if you're doing everything from telehealth. So mm -hmm. it was a really easy out and realizing, again, with just the combinations of the pandemic and work-life balance going outside the window and not getting paid that I realized, oh, I could be making like three times as much seeing half the amount of clients that I see now. So I went ahead and did it. And with that, never looking back and really enjoying the decisions that I made for myself because I'm finally in love with my work day in and yeah. day out. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so I know some segment of our listeners are clinicians or trained to be clinicians. Do you have any advice for them in terms of like, you know, life after grad school, uh, private practice versus agency work, anything like that? Yeah, yeah. And it's good to be thinking ahead. And if I encourage people to let go of the money concerns for just a little bit and just ask yourself, yeah, what's your dream job? Like, what do you want to do day in and day out that just fills you up with joy that you could do every day? Um, and sometimes those answers, those dreams are very different. Maybe it's not exactly going into agency work or researching or, um, you know, being at a hospital. Um, and so with that, I would say, keep your options open. Um, be really mindful too of the fine print in your um, onboarding documents or legal documents, um, especially for like payment. Like, really asking the questions like, okay, how much? How much am I actually going to get paid um, for those thinking about um, you know agency work? Asking very frank questions of what what is my caseload going to be like? Because they may tell you one thing, um, and the reality is another. If you do have the opportunity to meet other um, staff members or colleagues, definitely ask them questions. Definitely notice, hey, are do they look really burnt out? Do they even have time to meet with you? Are you even able to interact with your colleagues prior to mm -hmm. employment? Um, and you know, for agency work, um, it, it it isn't for everyone. Um, it can be really great learning experience if let's say you haven't had a lot of experience in a certain kind of patient population, or you think you just need to build your skills. 
Um, and for those who struggle with finances, especially coming out with a shit ton of debt and loans, there well, the loan forgiveness program in agencies or some kind of governmental settings can be very appealing. But I also want to encourage too, of like, okay, if your dream job is to go into private practice, be your own boss, see the clients that you love seeing, you can do it by going into private practice. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that really was concerning for me um, was that business standpoint of like, how the fuck am I going to run a business? I I know psychology. I know nothing of marketing, running a business. Um, but I want to encourage you know, listeners that if you got through graduate school, you can learn anything. Hmm. And business is just a new skill that you are learning. Yeah. And with that, and maybe the natural curiosity, the nat- natural passion, you'll pick it up really, really quickly. It is not rocket science. Trust me, it is going to be so much easier and dare I say fun um, than your dissertation. Um, so it completely is possible to do the things that you actually want and have a sustainable work-life balance. It is achievable. That's awesome. So let's see where to go from here. So I know that many clinicians, uh, like even during grad school, right, when you're getting trained, sometimes will hone in or typically will hone into maybe a population that has like a specific uh mental illness that we're going to treat, or we're going to use a certain style of therapy. And then once folks get into private practice, they basically try to ramp up those uh, specific things so that it's more like of a focused business, I suppose. Yeah. Um, And that they can be doing the same thing over and over and, you know, getting better at it. And it's the thing they like to do. So what, what would you say are like the main things that you focus on in your private practice? Yeah, so niching is so important, especially if you're putting up your shingle on. People want a specialist. They want someone to mm-hmm. know what they're talking about, um, especially if you have premium fees or not taking insurance. Yeah, you got to know exactly what you're doing. Um, yeah. So for me, I specialize in giving therapy to therapists. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of therapy for therapists out there. Um, yeah. For some odd reason, they're like intimidated to – help out another therapist. It's weird. Um, So therapy for therapists, perfectionism, uh, people who are in the uh, mental health field or health profession field. So essentially burnout, attachment trauma, exploitation, um, and most importantly, ADHD. So a lot of folks um, have a lot of challenging difficulties with ADHD, especially in these demanding careers, especially as entrepreneurs too. Um, And it is unfortunate that there's not a lot of ADHD affirming care out there, Um, especially therapists that feel comfortable being open with their diagnoses Um, because getting neurodivergent care from a neurodivergent therapist probably is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Mm. Yeah. So we we haven't, (coughs) excuse me, we haven't touched on ADHD yet. And you had mentioned previously that you were diagnosed later, a little bit later in life with ADHD than, than is typical. And typical is usually like in, would you say early childhood, middle childhood? Yeah. So this is the really interesting thing about the, the research on ADHD diagnosis is that, um, boys or men are most likely diagnosed very early due to most likely the hyperactivity, the externalizing behaviors, and not Mm. being able to do things in class. So they're kind of diagnosed in in early childhood. Um, But women with ADHD, especially inattentive ADHD, the research indicates that the average age of being diagnosed is 37 years old. Wow. That's a really fucking long time to be struggling with something and knowing that there's care, there's medication available that can really transform your life. Um, so with that, I was diagnosed at the age of 29 um, mm-hmm. during my like internship year at fellowship because I finally had really good health insurance that I could get a diagnosis yeah. and neuropsychological testing involved too. Um, but it was really interesting too because 
I never really thought I had it, even in my graduate training, you know, learning about ADHD diagnoses and all the neuropsychological assessments. I was like, ah, there's no way I can do this. But I know there's something weird and off about me and it takes me fucking forever to do everything. Time management is terrible. Rejection sensitivity. I didn't even know these words at the time, but it is so interesting to look back and be like, oh, okay. That's, that explains it all. That explains the the challenges in academia and personal Mm. relationships too. Man. So you went through all of, pretty much all of grad school, basically being undiagnosed. Right. Right. Um, and I, I wish if I could go back in time, getting a diagnosis earlier yeah. prior to college, um, just because uh, thinking about like all the exams, I having to take like prepping for the GRE and all that kind of bullshit. I struggled really hard with standardized testing throughout my whole entire life, basically because of time management. Um, and time pressure is the worst thing. I just like freak out even on like video games. It's like, Oh God, no, get me out of here. Um, and I really did wish that I had those accommodations for extra time or, um, let's say distractibility, like more silence places for me to do my work. Um, I I think my life would be completely different, um, or at least (laughs) a little bit less, uh, stressful and chaotic in graduate school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you mind sharing what, uh, tools or resources or treatments that you found most effective for yourself? Of course. Yeah. I'm happy to share that. For me, mindfulness, meditation, and mindful hypnosis Mm. was incredibly helpful. Um, I understand that a lot of people maybe have strong opinions about meditation or even hypnosis. Um, especially with ADHD, they may be like, how can I sit still and meditate? Um, but remembering that mindfulness is bringing back to the contact of the uh, present moment mm. of just being, you know, radically accepting of your experiences, being able to be with your mind compassionately and notice thoughts come and go. Um, so that can be such a great skill of cultivating calm groundedness and not getting caught up with every thought that goes through your mind. Um, so Specific therapies that are mindfulness-based, I think, are really helpful. Uh, Specifically, acceptance and commitment therapy is awesome. Dialectical behavioral therapy is really great, too. Um, EMDR, or eye movement desensitization and Mm -hmm. reprocessing therapy, uh, one of my favorites, um, Mm -hmm. is really helpful for trauma or distressing situations, which for ADHD minds... There's a lot of attachment trauma. There's a lot of shame and embarrassment and negative messages told about you and your life. To kind of reprocess that could be really helpful. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So what, um, to get back to like your story and growing your private practice. So you went to grad school. You didn't have all these tools or, or maybe weren't necessarily using them in the same kind of regimented way. Now you're out of grad school, you're setting up your private practice, and you basically are jumping into a whole new field, which is running a business. Yeah. Um, So what was that experience like of learning how to run a business? Way easier than I expected. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Of course, there's the fear and the anxiety of like, oh, shit, can I do this? Like, how the fuck am I going to make my own money? Um. And that imposter syndrome, yeah, that was there. And I will say for anyone who's thinking about entrepreneurship or setting up their own business, that's just part of the journey of downing yourself and doing it anyway, seeing what happens. Um, And so kind of ramping up what I found was invaluable um, is turning to my colleagues, turning to my therapist community, asking them the do and don'ts of running a business um, and then for me, what was really helpful is engaging in uh, therapy business coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, so major shout out to Allison Perrier's Abundance uh, Party uh, Practice Building. She has a great podcast um, about the ins and outs of starting up your own um, private practice, no matter where you are, 
right out of graduate school or escaping an agency job. So having that kind of structure of learning from the ones who are experienced is so helpful. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's you can follow templates and kind of guide you through that. Um, but for me, I really needed someone to help hold me accountable to do all the paperwork things, um, setting up my business account, helping with my business and marketing strategy. You really do need a team or at least someone else to bounce ideas off of, proofread. You don't have to do it alone. Um, and so with that, it, like I said, it was a surprisingly easy. Um, trying to make work into serious play of, you know, designing your own website, your own brand. That can be really fun and exciting. Um, so with that, that consistency is key and, you know, leaning on others and even consider investing in yourself so that you can, you know, do it right or create it from the get-go with your work-life balance and, and top of your mind. Very cool. I forgot to ask, do you have uh, like a specific name for your private practice? Yes. So with that, I have it as Mindful Hypnosis Counseling and Consulting. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. What would you say is like the next step or something on the horizon for uh, you and your private practice? Oh, so many ideas. Um, so with that, leaning more and more into consultation services, um, already consult with a lot of uh, mental health and wellness apps, providing content of mm. meditation and hypnosis, but going more towards even more so than I already am of helping to develop apps with mental health on the top priority, um, developing ADHD friendly apps because that is so necessary. Mm. Um as well as leaning more into speaking engagements and coaching as well. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. So we, we went a little bit long with the discussion of uh, uh, exploitation in grad school, but I felt that was super important to keep talking about that, um, especially since we hadn't touched on it on the podcast before. Now, I do have a fair amount of questions from Instagram for you. All right. I'm ready. So let's jump in and see what we got. Okay. We will not be able to touch on all of these. Sorry, That's folks. fine. But we'll <laughs> we get to as many as we can. Throw it into Instagram. <laughs> answer it there. For sure. Uh, how do you understand if you have burnout? Oh, that's such a good question. Probably if you're asking yourself, am I burned out? <laughs> um, other ways of thinking about it of if it's really fucking hard to get up in the morning, that no matter how much you sleep, you are still so fucking exhausted that the things that you once thought were enjoyable, you, you can't really do anymore. You don't feel like it. Or you notice yourself isolating yourself from friends um, loved ones, um, other things of just being so, uh, in a way, so down on yourself, so hard on yourself, or angry at your job or angry at yourself. Yeah, you're burnt out. You, you got to take a break. You got to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> here's a great one that goes a little bit back to our conversation about exploitation in grad school, potentially. What are some of the best ways to set boundaries with abusive mentors and deal with people who do not respect our boundaries? I'm so glad that you're asking this question in preparation. Let's see. Knowing effective communication skills of setting boundaries, of stating what you can do and what you cannot do, not asking for permission to do something, basically saying a statement of, I cannot do that today and I will get to it, you know, setting a, a, a date so that you aren't kind of working up into 3 a.m. Um, if, you know, an advisor or mentor says something very you know, verbally abusive to you, 
if you have the courage to say, I was really hurt by that. I feel this respected right now. Can you please not say that again? Um, or really being upfront and asking for expectations, um, whether it is the expectations of the lab or the mentor, um, being really clear with that and allowing the other person to be and communicating really clearly what you can and cannot do as far as your your hours, like when do you work and when don't you work. Um, and knowing that you don't have to do everything that is asked of you. You can say no, and no is a complete sentence. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a funny one. I guess as an ex-therapist, so that was a funny one. What do you do whenever a therapy session is stalling and you don't know what to say? Oh, that's such a good question. I love that. Um, I'm trying to think of what I usually do. Honestly, a lot of my sessions are so jam packed that there's not a lot of stalling involved. Yeah. Um, I sometimes just say like, I noticed there's a lull here. Is there anything else that you want to bring up or, you know, Anything, anything else that's been in your, on your mind or even kind of leaning on memes and asking, yeah. you know, how they they are doing and their like passions or hobbies, um, leaning into more positive rather than trying to dig for the negative. Yeah, for sure. We already touched on this, but, um, thought it was funny given our previous conversation. Why do advisors treat their grad students like shit? Because quote, they went through it too. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they were never trained to, you know, be respectful. Um, they, they just did not know. And I will say that there's very limited opportunities for training on how to supervise, how to mentor. It's not a required course. Um, and most programs are like, building up into academia. And so with that lack of information and that lack of modeling and their experience, they literally do not know anything else. And that's still not okay. That That is not an excuse. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Here's, a, here's two questions about ADHD. I'll kind of put them together. Um, so how do you survive in grad school with long-term projects and difficult lab environments when you have ADHD? Yeah, that is a toughie. What worked for me is that as a very visual person, um, I needed to have a game plan for the week ahead and of the day ahead and noticing when my mind works best on what tasks. Mm. Um, so for me, I know that I write best in the morning. Um, my mind is just on. It's you know filled with caffeine. Um, there's not as many distractions available or you no know, demands. So really blocking and being firm with myself of like do not disturb, making my environment so that it is just an incubator <laughs> for that project at hand. Um, the skill of literally leaving your phone in a completely different room or having your partner or friend lock it up so you're not tempted to scroll. Um, and for me, kind of being a visual planner, um, what I like to do was I would do like a brain dump. I would write down all the things that I need to do, just like taking a literal shit out of my mind and putting it on paper and noticing what are my top three priorities and just focusing on that. Um, and then in a way of time blocking, but for me, time walk blocking works a lot better, uh, when I drew out a circle or a clock and filled out what hours, um, are dedicated to each task to like a visual container because putting them on like Google calendar. Yeah, no, it doesn't give you the actual demand of how much a task is going to take, how long right. it is. Um, cause you're, we're time optimists. Time does not exist for ADHD brains. Mm. Um, and also for me, it was um, doing mindful self-hypnosis to clear my mind before I do any challenging tasks um, and religiously using Google Calendar for any kind of reminders and multiple reminders. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is, uh, so you didn't post doc, so the first mm -hmm. part of this question isn't relevant, but whenever you're transitioning to a job, and I know you went to private practice, yeah. but let's say like the job before, yeah. um, whenever you it comes to negotiating salary or benefits or anything like that, any tips or tools uh, that you would point to in terms of negotiating with your new employer or soon to be employer? Yeah. And I'm glad that people are asking this question because negotiate whatever kind of, you know, employee contract or offer you get negotiate. Cause you can, it's not a set and done rule. As far as tips for what to negotiate for, take some time and really look at your finances to see if what it what is your standard of living? Like how much do you need to make in order to meet those bills? And yes, have time for fun and leisure. What is that kind of like income that you need? And if that job is below it, ask for it. Um, ask for that number and probably using some psychology terms, like overshoot it by maybe like 5,000 or so. Um, so that again, Maybe they'll automatically take that number that you give them as far as a raise increase, but oftentimes they'll try to like just meet you in the middle. So of course, aim higher, meet in the middle if it works for you. Um, also thinking about it's not just salary, but seeing if you need to negotiate for particular times that you want to work. Like let's say you want to have a telehealth day or a telework day, um, or you want to be fully remote. Um, see if that is a possibility and ask for that. Um, or even what uh, a lot of people like compressed tours so they can have Fridays off. Um, ask for what you need and see if they are able to do that for you. Um, because if you don't ask, you don't receive and they don't know. And always remember that you have power in these negotiations. These companies need you to make their ends meet. It's not the other way around. You have the power and choice to up and go wherever you need. So you're not like locked into any kind of um, employment. Yeah, that's great. And that that's one thing that I've, I've felt in the transition to industry is there are certainly there's so many more people looking for jobs in industry, but wow, there are so many more jobs and mm -hmm. employers know that people are going to shift around, they're going to find new jobs. And it's not this like trapped world that you feel in academia where you have no power, you're in this tunnel for five years until you get done. It's, um, yeah, yeah, I, I really resonate with what you said. Yeah. So last question from Instagram. And then I have a question kind of going back. Cool. Uh, how do you say no to new projects without feeling like you're missing out on a great opportunity? Uh, oh man one gets me. oh it gets me too i'll be honest i still struggle with that shit all the time i want to do all the cool fun things and noticing yeah fomo is one hell of a bitch um for me it's really recognizing um well first i would say let me get back to you on that i need to check my prior mm -hmm. commitments to see if i can even do this thing well yeah saying like, hey, I'm really excited and I need to check myself before I wreck myself. Um, so really take some time to think about it. Do you have the time and space? Look at your calendar. Can you afford to put like an hour or two or however it's needed in the project? I also like to ask, what are my roles and expectations with this, this role, this new project? What is the time commitment, including meetings, expected deadlines, hours of work per week. So you get a better sense of, can I squeeze this in? Or is this going to be way bigger than I can actually chew? Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, okay, so the thing I want to go back to, and you, you had mentioned this off mic, um, and I thought it was an interesting statement. You said that ADHD, Brian, ADHD brains have natural skills and talents. What did you mean by that? Yes. Our brains are different. We're wired differently. Uh, with that, there's natural skills of creativity. We think differently. We see things differently. We perceive the world differently. And that aspect of adding that creativity 
can be so val- valuable of changing up how the world kind of works. We're natural problem solvers. We probably problem solve from the day we were born because we just we think differently than the neuro di- uh, the neurotypical brains and we have to figure out okay, how can we get this done even with our brains being weird and different. Um the hyper focus can be fucking mm. awesome if used yeah. well and honed in of being able <clears throat> to really dive into a project, being so passionate, so laser focused that everything else fades into the background. Um, ADHD uh, folks have more of a propensity for going into flow, which mm. flow is kind of like a state of trance of just complete immersion of getting shit done, feeling in the zone, just killing it. Um, Because, yeah, we can really hyper-focus. We are just naturally curious and poly-passionate. So we can uh, synthesize and combine things that maybe most people haven't thought of, like combining mindfulness and hypnosis together. Yeah, they do work. Um, And with that, I think there's just this abundance amount of empathy and compassion of really being able to connect with people on a different level of, you know, really feeling what a person is feeling. And that what makes us really great connectors and communicators. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. We are about at time. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how people can find you different resources you have, all of that. Before we jump to that, is there anything you wanted to chat about that I didn't bring up or that we didn't get to today? I'm trying to think about that. I think we covered a lot of different things, and I hope it wasn't too scattered. Um, And it's kind of giving a taste of all the cool things that entrepreneurship can offer. Um, So I would say, like, my takeaway is that, yeah, graduate school fucking sucks, and it's so much better. Once you get through it, there's so much freedom to do exactly what you want to do without having to answer to anyone else, especially if you want to go into entrepreneurship, um, Mm. that you have all the skills that you need to get through it and don't let your shitty advisor make you doubt yourself. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Liz, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Let it, let us chat for a bit about how people can find you. Um, I know I already mentioned your Instagram. Yeah. It's Dr. Liz Listens. Uh, for listeners, you can scroll down into the episode description, and I'll have a clickable link there to go to uh, your Instagram, Liz. You off mic. You also mentioned um, you have a mailing list, and it wasn't just a mailing list. It was a mailing list with a couple other things. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. So my mailing list or newsletter is for dopamine hits and productivity tips. So when you join, you'll get a collection of all the free tools that have helped me sane that I use every day. So you'll get access to the brief mindful hypnosis meditations that were used in my study that is evidence-based to help reduce stress and create resiliency. You'll also get free premium guest pass access to the Aura app, which I collaborate, that gives wellness, mental health, um, as well as access to a lot of uh, meditations and hypnosis tracks. And you'll also gain access for a month-long premium trial of Sansama, which is a productivity and calendar app that I swear by. It's it's changed my life, and I wish it was inexistent when I went to graduate school. So you can try it now. And I hope you can enjoy all these goodies and that we can, can connect further. That's so awesome. And then the last one is you mentioned you had a uh, YouTube channel. I do. And I actually stumbled on it last night um, when I was just like thinking through and preparing to talk to you. All right, folks. So at this point in the video, we ran into some technical difficulties that ended up actually deleting the last about five or 10 minutes or so of my video and audio. However, we still do have Liz's video and audio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in Liz's video and audio to everything. And then I'm going to basically narrate the parts that are missing from me to basically say like 
what my response was to something, if I can remember it, but also like what question I, I, I asked her next that she's answering. So I hope that makes sense, and here we go. So here I've just asked Liz about her YouTube channel and everything that's on it. That's right. So guided meditations, mindful hypnosis, other kind of productivity uh, tips and tricks. Um, and yes, you probably really will notice that my voice does sound a little bit different of talking voice versus my transcend mindfulness voice. But yeah, it's a, a great place to get some other free content. Here I asked Liz what the name of her YouTube channel is. It is Your Zen Within, Relax with Dr. Liz. Here is where I asked Liz if she had any other resources that she wanted to share. Yeah, the link tree. And also want to shout out with this as well of if you are looking for community and solidarity, I do have a free Facebook group for uh, ADHD folks in the mental health field that are interested in entrepreneurship and business tips. It's a really awesome, fun place. We share a lot of memes, a lot of skill swapping going on and bodily doubling and accountability. You can join that by just searching how to thrive with ADHD. Here is where I asked Liz, what is the one thing she thinks that every grad student should do before they graduate? Have fun. Go travel. Have a life outside of graduate school. Because if you put your whole entire being and self-worth in something that is so unpredictable, so much determined by your mentor, you're going to be fucked. Um, so find your joy. Do something fun. Find an identity outside of being a graduate student. Here's where I thanked Liz for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. And one thing I just want to say that I love your logo. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it like the no face from... Okay, yes, I knew it. I, I was like, fuck yeah. I have a little no face over here. It's really cute. I don't know if you see it. Yeah. <laughs> So this is where I confirmed that yes, yeah. the logo I use for my account was created uh, kind of with the idea of the character No Face from the movie <laughs> Spirited Away by Hayao Miyazaki. And I think I talked for a little bit about like why Hayao Miyazaki films meant so much to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yay. And that's what kind of drew me completely to it. I was like, oh, yes, this is awesome. And seller logo and, you know, really thoughtful logo. So here I nerded out a little bit more about different Hayao Miyazaki films that I liked, like Castle in the Sky, um, Prince Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro, How's Moving Castle, etc. Yeah, yeah. Spirit, Spirit Away was my, my first Miyazaki film. Um, seen in theaters, actually, back up. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to go and see this. Um, but Princess Mononoke was my first. Here's where I started to just kind of wrap up the podcast again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just let me know how I can best support you. I've been telling all my friends um, in graduate school. So I have a few people that I think would be perfect guests. Um, that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of shit in graduate school, but yeah. Just you let me know how I can best support you. Here's where I thanked Liz again for coming yeah. on the show and of said course. goodbye. You take care, Matt. Yeah, bye. Folks, thank you for tuning into the Grad School Sucks podcast. I hope you got a lot out of my conversation with Liz today. If you did end up enjoying the episode, please consider leaving a rating or a view on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Be sure to check out the description of today's episode for links to everything Liz mentioned, including her socials, as well as free meditations and mindfulness tools. As always, I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and I look forward to bringing you another great episode next week. See y'all next time. The first question, Liz, is what is your spirit animal? Oh, I love that question. Viewers can't see this, or maybe they can, but a unicorn. I mm. absolutely love unicorns. I always have as a child. Um, to me, they're just really mystic and magical and badass. Yeah, very cool. What would you say your... I don't, I don't think we've had unicorn before. 
What would you say your real life superpower is? My creativity. It, How so? It comes in handy in anything, anytime, anywhere. Um, with creativity, it makes hard shit fun mm. of creating you no know, work as serious play. Um, and mm. as an artist myself too, just finding ways to make things beautiful or different. Um, for me, that just creates a lot of meaning and valuable stuff in my life. Yeah. It's interesting. I never thought about creativity like that. Yeah. Um, last question. If you could snap your fingers and go anywhere in the world, you can do it at any time you want, but it always goes to the same place. And when you're done, you can snap your fingers and go back to wherever you were before. What would that place be? Oh, my. There's a lot of places that come to mind, but hmm. my favorite one, which is actually my my place of peace that I do a lot of my mindful hypnosis in um, is this beautiful secu secluded hike that basically goes into a waterfall lagoon and the water um, has a lot of mica in it so it's like sparkling and just reflective um, and you can literally just like chill and just float in the lagoon near the waterfall um, and that's in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. Hmm. That's awesome. Awesome.